All right, uh, next up is Spiros Agassi is going to be talking about what's the container aspect. Thank you. Hello, I'm Spiros. I'm competing engineer, competing engineer at the Cell Cloud Team, and I'm the project team in the, on the OpenStack Magnum project. It's the container infrastructure management project of OpenStack. And I'm going to talk about the uh, OCI containers. So, OCI containers. First, uh, let me say that the Linux containers are just processes, normal processes controlled by Linux kernel, uh, by Linux control groups, and the uh, namespaces, so it's totally different than the so uh, it's a totally new mindset. But specifically about OCI containers, um, the most popular containers are containers manned by Docker. And in 2015, uh, Docker and uh, other vendors uh, created the OCI specification. So the OCI specification has three parts. It's the runtime specification that defines uh, how the runtime should understand the configuration which describes the container and how it should run it, how we should create mount, uh, mounts, namespaces, and these capabilities, and how to uh, do the lifecycle operations of the container. Then uh, there is the image spec, which defines uh, how the image should be composed, that um, the image should have a manifest that uh, describes uh, uh, the layers uh, with the uh, image index, and also there's the set of uh, layers described uh, in the image index. And of course, it has the configuration configuration. And finally, it's the file system bundle. So uh, when uh, the container runtime or any other tool pulls an image that it's uh, OCI compliant, it extracts it in the file system bundle that has a root file system where the container will start and the configuration which uh, points to that root file system and describes um, all the capabilities uh, and the things that I mentioned. Uh, but why we need the, the, the OCI containers? So, as I said, containers are just Linux processes. So, uh, you need someone to start the container. And most likely, if you have more than one containers, you need a supervisor of these containers. If you are in a large deployment, uh, most probably you orchestrate the containers. So, you have a system like Docker Swarm, or Kubernetes, or Nomad, or uh, Mesos, DCS, something else. But if you are in a single post and you don't want to orchestrate, you need something to manage the your containers. Uh, in uh, most Linux distribution, processes are managed by systemd. So an idea would be to manage uh, data containers with systemd, but that means you decode systemd, and then systemd does a call to Docker daemon, and then Docker daemon talks to the kernel to create the container. Uh, this has some indirections because when we talk the Docker daemon, the Docker client, we do an API call. So that might be asynchronous, and uh, you introduce a direction in systemd. So it's better to manage containers either directly with a Docker team or with systemd. Uh, another use case is Kubernetes. Kubernetes was initially started by helping, uh, by talking to Docker, but uh, that means again, that meant again that it could be doing the uh, to the Docker team. So in Kubernetes, where with a component that uh, creates the actual containers with this kubelet, they created the CRI specification. And there are a couple of uh, CRI specification implementations, like one is the CRI container D and the CRI O. Uh, container D is a project uh, um, is a project on the demon that is behind Docker now and is developed by Docker team and other contributors. And CRIO is another specification that is another implementation of the CRI specification that is implemented um, uh, initially by Red Hat and other contributors, and it was based in the previous uh, design of, of Docker. So, a use case for, for that is, um, and one more use case, use case that I will describe later is like a chicken egg problem. So, what if you need a process that uh, needs to start before Docker? and potentially manage Docker or configure Docker. So if you have a, an orchestrated environment based on Docker, you might and not be able to run all your containers as Docker containers, so you might want both of them. Um, 
So in this talk, I will try to motivate why I got into this. So I would like to clarify that I'm coming from the, like, the user's perspective. I'm the developer of the OCI specification or uh, any of these tools, but I'm actually the user and consumer of them. So all this consumption comes from the same container service. Uh, so at CERN, we have uh, just one minute to describe what CERN is. I hope that you already know. It's the uh, European Council of uh, Nuclear Research, and that does uh, fundamental analysis and most probably particle physics. So at CERN, we have a big accelerator that uh, accelerates uh, protons that create collisions, and these collisions uh, create events and lots and lots of data. So our, our, most, uh, our biggest uh, use case is batch processing. Uh, to, 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 to process all, all this data. Um, and in 2018, or for, since 2015, uh, containers are uh, a very good use case to define workloads that, that will run in a computing grid or in a clustered environments. So there is a big motivation. Other use cases are end user analysis, which are most prominently defined by Jupyter notebooks that you can build uh, a container that essentially it's a notebook and you can uh, do uh, analysis and then share the container images so that other physicists elsewhere can do uh, the same analysis and uh, be sure that it will run in the same environment and it will have uh, exactly the same results. And other things that all uh, IT companies and IT environments have is construction management, continuous replacement deployment. As we are a big OpenStack shop, we also run OpenStack in containers and other changes. So the container service is based on a project called Magnum, since I'm the project team in the Wichita. So this is a similar, this is a very simple workflow. Bit. So in the first command, we just create a cluster and we say, in this case, that I want a Docker Swarm cluster with 100 nodes and we wait some time, in our case, it's five minutes or maybe less or more, depending on the environment. You wait for the cluster to be complete. And then you just get the credentials to talk directly to the ticket Docker daemon uh, on the master nodes and just orchestrate your containers. And in this case, as you can see, after two commands, you don't have to do list. You, can, you start uh, to talk to the cluster and then the other demon, so no open stack anymore. And this is how a node uh, looks, even if it's Swarm or Kubernetes, in this uh, environment that uh, Magnum creates. So in the upper box, we have a, a Swarm cluster that has a Docker demon. In the legacy Swarm, before Swarm mode, you have a Swarm agent that's running a container on every node. You also have the um, ETCD that it should run only in, or console that should run only in master nodes. In our case, we have some server plugins which we run them in containers. And then we have an OpenStack agent that takes configuration from OpenStack and applies to the nodes. Similarly, and even more complicated in the Kubernetes use case, we have more Kubernetes components. We have Flannel, we have ETCD, uh, we have a CRI runtime, and then we have the agent and the plugins that we want. So in the case of, uh, for example, for the legacy swarm, if you wanted to run ETCD um, in a container, um, you should, and you had only Docker, it's a chicken egg problem because you need to start ETCD before starting Docker. So if you want to start this Docker container, there is a, like a deadlock there. So what we want to do is to start uh, in um, it is in a different way, like uh, as a managed container by systemd, and then deploy the swarm cluster. It's uh, exactly the similar use case in um, Kubernetes. So if you want to run, for example, kubelet in a container, and you know, if you want to run kubelet in a container managed by Docker and kubelet, you need to, you, you, you cannot know which one to start first. So in our case, we can start Kubelet in a system demand container, and then we can start Docker again in a system container, and then uh, stop that container and start the pod in, in that node. And of course, uh, um, the, the other use case is uh, the OpenStack agent, which uh, defines and configures all of this. So since th this agent uh, configures everything, it must start first and before all. So this was the initial um, 
um, motivation. And for all uh, for these um, problems, um, we end up looking at the NCI containers. So how to build them? Um, uh, I was about to, to describe the build up, but um, since I found it more complicated, I think it's easier to build manually. So a system container is um, a container that uh, runs in uh, atomic hosts. And the project Atomic um, has a Fedora and Santos Atomic host. Uh, Santos Atomic host, and if you are in the enterprise world, they have a Red Hat offers the Red Atomic host. But in our case, we use the Fedora or Santos. Um, this comes with the atomic utility and some uh, set of other tools that allows you to create uh, containers to be managed by systemd. And to build those containers, that you must have, um, you must build them and to be OCI compliant. So we have a Docker file, and then we use Docker to build them. Um, the image, and then we have a, a systemd template which would be added to the Docker uh, image and then extracted by a deployment and deployed on the node so then, so then systemd knows how to manage that container with run C. We have a list of, uh, of TMP files, which are files that may be that container for to do some bind mounts, assume that they exist on the host, but maybe, maybe they don't. And then a manifest JSON, which are default values for the application of the trans in the container and the configuration, which is the standard from uh, the OCI specification. You can have a look on all these files in the link that I put before. So this is how it looks uh, to build the container. Um, th there is a Hello World example, of course, in um, the Atomic System Containers um, repo. So you can you just uh, build the Hello World Atomic, uh, the Hello World container as a normal one that you would do with Docker, and then you push it to a registry. And then you can just do atomic install, which is uh, sort of only an atomic host, but then um, there's also available in uh, Debian based uh, systems. And if you do atomic install, manage my system, which means that it will run as root, unless you specify otherwise in the configuration, and then you can give it a name, which and that name will create a, a systemd uh, service based on that template. And then you can do just the uh, system CTL start the world and start uh, that system T service. Um, so in our case, it was a perfect solution. We, we could run uh, whatever clients and open stack specific tools that we wanted and do without modifying the host. So treating the host as a middleware infrastructure that we don't take host and we install a bunch of things or we don't just rebuild hosts all the time, we just take the active distribution and then we extend it as we want. But um, if you start looking into OCI containers and if you ask anyone that uh, works on them, the most difficult part is to create the configuration file. And so in, in one of the first uh, websites um, and documentation of uh, RANSI, the OCI specification, they said, this is how to create a template, and then you populate it. Like video, there was nothing uh, after that, there was no documentation. So you should start to, uh, starting about the namespaces. I put the URL on the main page of the kernel. But um, the per minimum that you need as an advice is the main namespace, because if, if, you don't, if, you don't, if you run a process without the main namespace, it just starts in the file system of the host. So the root file system of the container just goes away and you don't use it. Probably you, you should add IPC, but uh, it's not important. Then you should add a user to have a user name spaces and separate processes by user. And then you might also need the ID to have, a, if you have more than one processes in your container, you might want to have a different name space. And usually for system containers, which are containers that are very close to the host, you, don't, you usually don't want to add a network namespace. It's better not, not to add it and, have, and share the same network uh, namespace with the host. Then, the capabilities. If you go to the website that I missed to add in here, of, of the Linux general map pages, the number of capabilities is endless. So one advice that you have that it's a very cool hack is if you start a container with Docker, and you will find, okay, this um, container that runs in Docker, what capabilities it's using, 
which is a very cool hack how to find it. You get the PAD of Docker, and then you go to the proc file system, and then uh, with some uh, grab and doc, you can find exactly which capabilities uh, you need. So this is one, uh, what we want to be the one of the first uh, iterations that I was doing uh, for my containers. And then, of course, you have uh, mounts. So in mounts, you should uh, be able to understand um, when do you want, uh, or what do you want to share with your host or share with your um, other containers. So in this case, in this case, um, this mount is a bind mount. The container will have a read access, and it's are private. So that means only my container will have access um, to that directory, and changes that I'm doing there are not propagated to the host. If I want to be propagated, they should have used are shared. And there is also the possibility to have a display, which means uh, only the host can change certain changes and then they are propagated to the container. Um, I think that concludes my talk. I finished a few minutes early. So I put in some links here and that you I advise you if you are into containers to go have a look at the runtime and the image spec. They are not very long and they are very very well defined. Um, don't follow all the links that they have because they go to RS specifications which are extremely long. And you can check the open spec system containers um, repo that I've contributed and the atomic team contributes. And you can base your own containers there. Of course, I use my project, which is the Natum project there, not the stack. And if you have any questions, you can give me a free note and a uh, bigger. Um, let's say, for example, that I am an Emacs user and I have a lot of plugins and a lot of settings. Can I make a container with my Emacs, my plugins, my settings, that whenever, whichever machine I'm, I'm running, I tell, for example, Docker to run this container, it's going to run with the user of that machine and not the super user of some special specific user in the container? Yes, you can do it. If it's defined in the computation, uh, Docker will follow the specification because Docker is a runtime, uh, it's an OCI compliant uh, runtime, so it will do it. And these containers that I described, uh, apart from some of the special files for the system the units, are just normal containers that Docker runs them as any other containers. Yeah, but, but how does Docker know which user was the user that spawned the container? Um, in that, usually the containers that you spawn, you spawn them as root, but then they run as a different user. They are not rootless containers. Yeah, but that, how does it know who to call them? The user, the user who invoked the container must know that's where it can no. become the user. The user that in created the container in the first place it will be the root. It will be root. And then inside the container, the user will be specified with the user ID and the 2 by 2.